Um, I have the pleasure to co-chair with Ellen Landay, who will take the questions at the end of the talks. So we will have all questions also at the end of the talks. Um, and I have been asked to make an introduction, so I prepared a few slides just to give an overview of uh, the last recent results on mechanisms of post-treatment control and to, to set the stage. So uh, what do we know about post-treatment control? Uh, post-treatment control, as you know, is observed more frequently in individuals who started initiate early on after infection. The mechanisms of post-treatment control are unclear but they generally seem to be different from those in HIV controllers. And so why there are no signs of enrichment of protective HLA alleles, the questions that can arise is are there other uh, genetic factors associated to post-treatment control or are there other types of T-cell mediated control different from that what is seen in HIV controllers or other mechanisms, other host and viral factors associated to post-treatment control. So what about CD8 T cells? Uh, here you see a summary of what has been described in studies that uh, analyzed uh, post-treatment controllers. Um, what has been described is that, for example, in two studies here in green, that while CD8 T cells were not able to prevent the rebound, they were negatively associated with a level of peak viremia or with the viremia after ITI. Um, in one study, in one post-treatment controller, what they show is that the CD8 T cells had cytolytic activity, but also secreted a soluble factor with antiviral suppress activity. And in another study, they observed CD4 specific, HIV specific uh, T cell responses. And what has been shown also, at least in an animal model, that the early IRT initiation enhances the uh, promotion of CD8 T cells with enhanced proliferation and survival capacities. So maybe that's uh, why um, they can uh, participate to the lower varimia. So overall, the question is maybe does post treatment control needs a combination of factors? What about antibodies? So there's a very recent paper that describes the bees BNAP knowledge in one PTC, but generally BNAP is also very rare in uh, post-treatment controllers, similar to other people living in HIV, with HIV. Uh, interesting, what has been described in some post-treatment controllers is the existence of antibodies that potently neutralize their own virus. Uh, so the question that might arise is, are there some viruses that are maybe more easy to, uh, to neutralize? Uh, but overall, much more studies are needed on the function of these antibodies in, in the post treatment controllers um, and including on the FC uh, and ADCC activities. What about innate immune responses? What do we know about that? It has, for example, been shown that the virus that rebound more often are interferon alpha resistant. Interferon alpha is uh, predominantly produced by plasma situated dendritic cells. And another study in the Thai cohort has shown that uh, robust activation of plasma situated dendritic cells and interferon, gamma, interferon alpha produ production is associated with a longer time to detection of viremia after ATI. So this could be eventually interpreted that um, the innate immune response, if they are strong at, at the moment of ATI, might give more time to the specific immune responses and to the memory responses to get mobilized and then participate to the control of viremia. Finally, among the immune, innate immune responses as effector cells, you have the NK cells that can act also in synergy with PNAPs. Um, and there are some studies that in when they uh, analyzed uh, immune responses in post-treatment controllers, uh, described higher levels of potent NK cells in these individuals. Uh, in one study, they also described high levels of gamma-delta T cells. And there's one unpublished study describing in about one-third of the French uh, Visconti stud study uh, patients or individuals that have a post uh, that are in remission uh, that they have an, a specific HLA profile that is associated eventually with uh, better NK cell education. Also, um, there are some studies that show that maybe the host cell can just, uh, develop factors that make them more resistant to NK cells. So a lot of things that need to be analyzed. And um, the question that raises here um, and with the other studies, if maybe 
uh, the mechanism of prostate milk control depends on the individual, and maybe there are different key mechanisms depending uh, on the individual, so a heterogeneity of prostate milk control. Overall, this, the, why, why are these studies done is to help to guide future interventions and to help to um, improve the current strategies toward HIV remission. Um, do these and do the interventions need to be uh, necessarily the same mechanisms as in post treatment controllers? No, uh, but they have similar aims. So the aim is the reduction of the viral reservoir and then to provide the host a durable protection to different mechanisms. I will not go into that for reasons of time. Um, and so uh, we can now start with the talks. Uh, where we will discuss all this, and here is the order of the talks. We will start with Keith Reeves, and um, so Keith is professor at Duke University, where he is also director in the Center of Human System Immunology and director of the Duke CIFAR Development Corps, and uh, I'm happy to call him. All right, so thanks uh, very much, Michaela, uh, for setting this up perfectly. Uh, and again, thanks very much uh, to the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to share some of our data today. Uh, so I'm gonna be changing gears a little bit uh, from what's been presented, I think, through most of the day uh, and focusing on, as Michaela alluded, uh, natural killer cells uh, as a potential mechanism of virus control, uh, but more specifically, antigen-specific uh, or memory or adaptive NK cells. All right, so just a little bit in the way of background, what do we know about how NK cells classically uh, can engage HIV-infected cells? Uh, so many of you are probably familiar with uh, engagement through NKG2D, uh, which recognizes the stress ligands uh, MIC-A, MIC-B, ULBP123. Uh, this is upregulated on stressed or dying cells. Uh, second mechanism that's, that's very common uh, is the interaction of MHC KIR. Uh, these can be either activating or inhibitory interactions and can be further modulated uh, by the peptide that's actually presented in the groove. Uh, now, the one that we probably think about the most, uh, I think because we are a little bit uh, antibody heavy, uh, is that we think about NK cells as serving as the effector arm uh, to cooperate uh, with the humoral response to mediate functions uh, such as ADCC. Uh, so I guess thinking about uh, these different types of functions, uh, there's a diversity of NK cell responses uh, that have been previously associated with control or prevention of HIV and SIV. So I'm just going to go through each of these uh, very briefly. So we know that expansion of various NK cell functions uh, serve as a potential correlative protection uh, in both highly exposed seronegatives as well as uh, vaccinees. Um, primarily in SIV models, but obviously from RV144. Uh, we know that NK cells can limit uh, virus infection and contribute to slowed overall disease progression uh, in persons living with HIV. Much of this has been shown in the cure space, particularly by uh, Mary Carrington's group. We also know that NK cells can be involved in inhibition of mother to child transmission uh, of HIV, and there have been mechanisms shown uh, that are both cure and ADCC dependent. Uh, largely through uh, SIV-infected macaque models um, of it by the people in this room, uh, have been shown that NK cells in particular can rapidly migrate to sites of infection and may even clear virus. And much of this has really been shown by beautiful work from Michaela's group uh, in Natural Host. Now, what I'm going to talk about finally today is uh, the concept of adaptive uh, or memory or antigen-specific NK cells as a potential novel uh, response of NK cells that could contribute. Uh, so uh, adaptive NK cells, memory NK cells, antigen-specific NK cells. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, this would have been considered uh, complete nonsense. Uh, but I think this field has really exploded so much that, that generally the, the immunology community accepts it uh, as a widely accepted phenomenon. And so now the best idea is, you know, what do we do with that information? Uh, so memory and adaptive NK cells can be identified in mice, humans, and non-human primates. This is not just a mouse phenomenon. Uh, we know that they can uh, rise specifically against a wide range of viral, bacterial, cancer, and vaccine antigens. And they have very unique, distinct phenotypes uh, and functions. But one of the complicated things about studying this cell population is that even though multiple uh, potential mechanisms have been shown, uh, these studies are largely incomplete. So much of the research uh, has shown that there can be cytokine-based regulation of adaptive uh, immunity among uh, NK cells, epigenetic functions, altered signaling, and of course what we're focusing on really today is the true antigen specific uh, NK cells, uh, which can really mount against uh, any antigen. Okay, so shifting more specifically to what's been shown uh, for HIV uh, and SIV, 
Uh, this was actually initially identified in any primate species at all uh, in SIV and SHIV infected uh, macaques. And this was done by my group uh, probably about eight years uh, ago now. Uh, now, since then, um, many studies have come forward showing that these can be induced in humans by CMV, influenza, VZV, HIV, vaccines, really anything uh, that you can imagine. And there's significant evidence that they're long-lived, and I'll also mention this briefly, that they are vaccine-inducible. Uh, uh, now, these are all old data, so I'm not going to go through this uh, in too much detail, but I think it's pretty clear to see that uh, in this type of ICS style assay, you can see antigen specific uh, in K cells mounting against gag pool peptides uh, in persons living with HIV, uh, but not in individuals uh, who are HIV negative. I think very interestingly, uh, in, a, in a separate study, this is a killing assay, uh, we can see that these cells are absent in HIV uh, negative individuals, but persons living with HIV that are viremic are those on antiretroviral therapy for a long time still remain uh, detectable uh, responses. But one thing that's actually quite interesting is that uh, even though this is a very small cohort, uh, these do seem to be a bit expanded uh, in elite controllers. Uh, and importantly, uh, through work that we did with the HVTN, uh, this population of antigen-specific cells is also inducible uh, by at least MVA vectors and VSV vectors uh, in HIV uh, uninfected persons. So they are vaccine uh, inducible without uh, the need for a replicating virus. So as I said, you know, we know virus infections vaccines can induce antigen-specific adaptive NK cells in multiple species, but how do we better understand the function and mechanisms of this novel cell population? Well, one thing that my group has been doing the past several years uh, is isolating, cloning, and expanding single antigen-specific NK cells. So we're developing clonal lines from a single peptide-specific NK cell to allow better understanding of the biology. And so I'm not going to go through this uh, in, in any degree of detail. I mean, these, these data are published, but essentially what you just see on the left is we isolate uh, individual uh, single antigen-specific cells. Uh, we grow them up on 8866 cells uh, that have been irradiated, as well as autologous or heterologous feeders. And then we simultaneously uh, grow up BLCLs as target at the same time, so that when it's been about four to five weeks, not only do you have a significant population of NK cell clones from a single antigen-specific NK cell, uh, but also targets. And again, not going to go through too much detail here, but I think in a specific killing assay, you can see from a wide range of persons living with HIV, we can identify many uh, GAG-specific NK cell lines, as well as OM-specific and even we can pull out uh, some CMV-specific uh, NK cell lines uh, for comparison. Now, something that's been very critical that's come out, and this goes back to the understanding of mechanism, something that's come out of these studies is that NKG2C has been directly implicated in HIV-specific NK cell responses. Now, as you can see on the left, uh, there have been a number of studies over the years that have been suggestive. Uh, that NKG2C is involved in a variety of, of different ways, uh, but much of this has not been confirmed. Uh, it's sort of the, the, the peptide specificity in the interaction level. So just a little bit uh, of a reminder, um, NKG2C is the activating receptor that binds HLA-E uh, as opposed to NKG2A, which is the inhibitory receptor. Now, I know we typically think of HLA-E as a mechanism to discriminate self versus non-self, but I think studies uh, in humans and in monkeys have also been able to show that, uh, that this can mediate uh, T cell responses. And now I think we're able to show that this, or at least what I'm going to try to convince you, is that it can mediate uh, NK cell antigen-specific responses as well. Now, going back to, to those previous assays that I had shown you, uh, looking at uh, NK cell specific killing against these uh, um, OMV or GAG uh, peptides, I think just a very simple experiment, and we can show it here, is if you just block NKG2C, you pretty much abrogate you know, all, almost your entire response. So I think that that's a good indicator that these peptides are mediating it through NKG2C. But if you want to take it a little bit further, uh, if we knock down NKG2C using siRNAs or CRISPR, again, you can see at the bottom that you almost completely abrogate uh, this antigen-specific response, confirming a good role uh, for NKG2C here. So what about the other side? Because that's really sort of the antigen targets that we're trying to get after. Uh, how do we look at uh, potential uh, HLA-E uh, peptides? So the process that, that we've taken uh, is a bit laborious, but I think it's probably uh, the most agnostic to get us where we need to go, is that first we look uh, for using uh, in silico design of, of peptides, just looking for 
monomers uh, that should uh, bind HLAE or could bind HLAE. Uh, then we synthesize all these peptides, uh, and then we evaluate their ability to stabilize HLAE on specialized populations of K562 cells. Uh, and so you can see at the bottom, uh, basically we've tested the HFV of and GAG proteomes. And within those, we've been able to identify uh, a handful uh, of peptides that are strong stabilizers um, and should uh, be mediating these type of responses. And for those of you that are asking, uh, these are VL9 mimics because they think you do have a limited bit of diversity here. Okay, so one of the, the, the first questions is obviously we want to see if we can see these in, in real patients. So we started with uh, patients from uh, Duke and UAB cohorts that we're working with and asked the question, could we identify clones, because those are single antigen specific in K, from our repositories that bind these peptides? And so that's exactly what we, we find. We go back and we look. This is showing uh, HIV OM that if we start pulling out our clones, most of them are directed uh, towards specific uh, OMV peptides that we predicted uh, would stabilize and be presented by HLAE. So just to sort of close the loop, now we go from the peptides to the clones. Now let's go back to primary cells. And so we're going to look and see if those HLAE stabilizing peptides do they make up the dominant response? And that's exactly what you see. And again, this is an ICS assay. Uh, you can see 107A on the left and interferon gamma production on the right. It is those two uh, peptides that we predicted to be HLA stabilizers that are actually dominating the response that you see in the pool. And so I think we can conclude from this that a variety of HLAE stabilizing peptides elicit responses by antigen-specific membrane K-cells, persons living with HIV. And I want to bring your attention to one in particular, uh, that VL9 uh, that's on the left. We're referring to it from, as OM423 for the rest of the presentation because it's going to come up uh, more than once. So one of the first things uh, I think we wanted to do next is see if we could verify uh, these type of findings in an independent cohort. Uh, so we work as part of the a uh, BEAT HIV uh, Delaney Collaboratory out of Wistar. Uh, so they had uh, a study where they're treating persons living with HIV uh, with interferon alpha. So our question was, one, could we identify these responses in those individuals? And two, did treatment with interferon alpha do anything? Because interferon alpha is uh, a stimulus uh, for NK cells. So unfortunately, uh, the treatment with interferon alpha really had no impact on uh, uh, the cell number or the number of these cells, but also it's important to note it had no impact on T cells or antibodies in these individuals either. But what is important is that if you look across, again, what are you seeing again uh, sort of on the left? It's that OMF uh, uh, 0.423 that is just absolutely dominating the response uh, in these individuals. So we're confirming that we find that single peptide response in a separate cohort uh, of individuals. All right, so the next uh, question that we moved on to is we wanted to see uh, if therapeutic vaccines might have any impact on the cell population, since we've already shown that they're inducible uh, by regular vaccines. And so again, this also presents us an opportunity to validate uh, this population in, in an independent cohort. Uh, so the first, this was done with UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, these are persons living with HIV with durable virus suppression, receiving one uh, IM dose of uh, MVA expressing gag and pull. So, of course, this is going to be a little different because there's no uh, OMF to look at. Uh, but again, what we see is those predicted uh, GAG uh, dominant peptides. That's exactly what we see popping up in these individuals, exactly as we expect. And interestingly, uh, particularly in individuals that have very low level responses, this vaccine, uh, the MVA, actually induces uh, an expansion of those cells, suggesting uh, that much like we saw uh, in the HPTN studies, that you could actually boost uh, this response with a vaccine. All right, so the next one, uh, this was done uh, with UCSF, the, the PINVAX. Uh, this is persons living with HIV with durable virus suppression, DNA plasmid plus uh, IL-12. Uh, again, same thing that they were showing uh, in the previous studies. It's those HLAE dominant peptides that we showed should be uh, the best binders and the best responders. That's exactly what we're seeing. And again, one of your dominants you see in the same time because this had uh, OMV included as well, that OM423 showing up as a dominant response yet again uh, in another cohort. Uh, now, these responses were a little bit mixed uh, post-vaccination. Uh, you can see sort of the matched pairs there. But again, it's the exact same thing, and particularly for that dominant peptide, OM423. You see in individuals with low responses, you get a nice increase uh, after vaccination. <clears throat> 
Okay, so just to sort of summarize that part uh, real quick, uh, dominant peptide specific responses seem to be conserved uh, regardless of cohort, which I think is of specific interest. And I think this fits other data that, that we've looked at suggesting the antigen specific NK response is narrow and focused on MHCE peptides. Uh, we know that uh, these responses can be modulated in vivo, uh, both by vaccination and potentially other means, uh, but we'll, we'll see what pans out uh, from, from other uh, uh, interventions. Uh, the next thing, uh, antigen-specific NK cells, they're robustly functional uh, and virus-suppressive in vitro. We've been able to show that. Uh, and the previous studies that we've done in, in monkeys also suggest they correlate with viral load, but I'm not going into that. But part of the issue is that this is very difficult to test uh, in vivo uh, in humans. So the approach that we're taking uh, is that thinking if we could infuse NK cell clones with this robust functionality against HIV, this could be a unique opportunity for immunotherapies. So basically what we're doing now is we're translating all of this uh, to SIV specific uh, re rhesus NK cell clones for a proof of concept study. And so I'm just gonna go through this very, very quickly uh, because it is still in development. You just see on the left, uh, we have no problems uh, growing uh, 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 single cell uh, rhesus NK cell clones. Uh, they maintain uh, phenotypic and functional properties of primary NK cells. This was very important for us to confirm. And they are highly cytotoxic. Uh, they can produce a lot of interferon gamma. Uh, they're very good at killing cells and upregulate a lot of CD107A as a surrogate indicator. So we can grow up these very uh, functionally potent cells. So the next thing, of course, is we've got to do uh, sort of our, our peptide screen, MHCE matching. Uh, but you can see this if we do the SIV proteome. You've got a lot of really great targets. Again, you've got uh, wonderful targets that are really strong stabilizers uh, in OV, as well as a couple in GAG and POL. Uh, and what's interesting, and I think is going to pan out uh, pretty interesting for these studies, is that those peptides that we're showing in orange as the HLAE targets are very highly conserved against eight or against uh, 11 SIV strains uh, that we've tested. And even though I'm not going to go into it, it's take some detail. Uh, those sequences are actually very well conserved between SIV and HIV uh, as well. Uh, so again, basically go through the exact same thing. Uh, we're using autologous BL, uh, BLCLs uh, and testing for killing, and we've already been able to identify a number of clonal lines uh, with potent responsiveness to various MHCE SIV peptides, and these are going into animals uh, to test virus suppression. So just to uh, summarize up, uh, like CMV, uh, HIV-induced responses use uh, the NKG2 uh, MHCE axis, although we admit other co-receptors and cofactors are likely involved. We know that we can confirm single uh, peptide level specificity with these single cell analyses. And again, I just want to reiterate that at least from our studies, we think this response is narrow and conserved. And I think that also makes it somewhat uh, ideal uh, that it's, uh, because it's in, uh, vaccine inducible, both preventively and therapeutically, uh, this could make uh, these antigen specific cells a great new target uh, for virus suppression. And so with that, I will just close and thank all the people uh, in, in my group and all the various collaborators for their participation. And of course, acknowledge the volunteers and study participants, uh, as well as all the funders. And thanks very much. Thank you, Keith, for an excellent talk. I'd like to now introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sarah Palmer, who is co-director of the uh, Center for Virus Research at the Westmead Institute for Medical Research and professor, faculty of medicine uh, at the University of Sydney. And Sarah's gonna talk to us today about mechanisms of post-intervention control. Dr. Palmer. Thank you, Alan. <clears throat> So Katie Fisher and our group and our research team, who's here today, developed a near, near full-length HIV RNA sequencing assay, which we call the PEARLS assay. And depending on the primers that Katie uses, we can sequence either an 8 or 5 KB region of HIV RNA. And because this assay is done at limiting dilution, we're able to actually assess the viral populations uh, in patient, participant plasma using this assay. So we have applied this assay to plasma samples from participants who've undergone multiple analytical treatment interruptions. And these are participants who've been enrolled in the PULSE study. And in the PULSE study, these participants were treated during acute early infection. They initiated ART for one year and then interrupted and reinitiated re ART three times. 
therapy was restarted when their viral load reached greater or equal to 5,000 copies during the analytical treatment interruption. And when the viral load was assessed in these participants in this study, it was found that they, they fell into two different groups. Non-controllers, so those participants who experienced rapid viral rebound at each of the treatment interruption time points, or transient controllers, those who experienced a rapid rebound at the first analytical treatment interruption, but showed so some control either at the second rebound and or at the third rebound um, time point. So we are currently assessing the viral and host factors that could be contributing to this transient control and these participants. And we assume that some of the viral factors could be related to cytotoxic T lymphocyte or CTL escape mutations or specific genes. And to assess these viral factors, we are conducting near full length HIV RNA and DNA sequencing of these participant samples. We're also assessing the host factors that could be contributing to this transit control. And these include CDL, CD8 T cell repertoire, the immunodominance of these CD8s, or the functionality of these CD8s. And we're, we're using multiple immune-based assays to really assess whether these host factors are contributing to this transient control. But today, I'd like to share with you our results from conducting the PEARLS assay and assessing the plasma samples in the, and the viral populations found in these plasma samples in the non-controllers versus the transient controllers. So this is participant three, and participant three is a non-controller. And the sequence, uh, sequences that I'm going to show you from our uh, at applying our pearls assay are genetically intact in the region that we sequenced. So for participant three, who's a non-controller, we sequenced virus at pre-art, rebound one, rebound two, and rebound three. And when we assess these sequences, we not only look at the tree topology, but we also conduct compartmentalization analyses, both tree-based and distance-based analyses. And this allows us to really determine the genetic similarity across these time points. And the tree-based and the distance-based analyses gave us similar results. So today, I'll just share with you the rights analysis, which is a distance-based analysis. So when we look at this topology of this phylogenetic tree from this non-controller, we found there's no obvious separation of the sequences from individual time points. We do see that some groups of pre-art and rebound three sequences cluster separately, and that's shown here for the pre-art. And the rebound and rebound one and rebound two sequences mostly intermingle with all the other sequences across this phylogenetic tree. So overall, there's low evidence for compartmentalization by time point in this non-controller. In fact, the virus is genetically similar across the time points. And we found this for all the non-controllers that we analyzed, that we found very low evidence for compartmentalization by time point, and that the virus was genetically similar across the time points. But when we looked at a transient controller, we saw a very different picture. And this is participant four. And we conducted uh, Pearl Sassy at pre-therapy, pre rebound one, rebound two, and rebound three. And when we looked at the phylogenetic tree, we see four very separate groups of sequences. And our compartmentalization analysis showed that there was strong evidence that the pre-art sequences are genetically different from all their time points, shown in group A. That there's strong evidence that the rebound one sequences are genetically different from all their time points, shown in group B. But interestingly, we found there was no evidence for compartmentalization between rebound two and rebound sequences that are intermingled across group C and Ds shown here. And however, these uh, sequences from rebound two and three are genetically similar. They are genetically different and significantly different from the other time points. So when we see transient control, the genetic composition of the virus is genetically different from the non-control or pre-therapy time points. We also analyzed participant five, who was a transient controller, and this participant showed transient control at rebound three and quite extensive transient control. So we sequenced the virus at pre-therapy, rebound one, rebound two, and rebound three. 
And what we found was that some groups of viral sequences clustered separately across pre-art and rebound one, as shown here. But overall, the viral sequences from pre-art, rebound one, and rebound two group together on this phylogenetic tree, as shown right in this top group of sequences. But we saw a very unique group of sequences and very strong evidence that the rebound three sequences were genetically different from the virus replicating prior to ART and the virus identified during first and second rebounds as shown in this box. So we found a very specific genetic clade for rebound three, which is significantly different than what we found in the other rebounds for participant five and the pre-therapy plasma sample. So we asked ourselves, what host and virological factors are contributing to the lower viral load and delayed viral rebound and these participants? In our sequence analysis, we did not see any evidence for drug resistance mutations. And across the PULSE clinical trial, no uh, drug resistance mutations emerged. And drug resistance mutations can reduce the replication competency of virus, but these did not emerge at the transient viral control time points. So Katie Fisher, in, co in collaboration with Gabby Duete and Fernando Mazir from Brazil, analyzed cytotoxic T lymphocyte or CTL escape mutations in these participants. And they analyzed those that are experimentally verified and, and shown by in publications, but also in the Los Alamos database. And they analyzed the GAG, POL, and NEF genes for these CTL escape mutations. And what Katie found was that there is a total of eight, six CTL escape mutations, but they were identified in all sequences across all time points. So this indicated to us that these CTL escape mutations either evolved during acute infection prior to our initiation or were transmitted during HIV infection. But the, the list of these experimentally verified mutations is quite small <laughs> and very limited. So Yunok Lee in our group, in collaboration with Amy Shelter, Shelton, a PhD student from uh, the Netherlands, developed a script which allowed Yunok and Amy to identify T cell epitopes across the whole genome. And these T cell epitopes were, to, were, to, were predicted to bind to the specific HLA of the participants. And what they found was the transient viral control in participant four is associated with the specific mutations in these predicted T cell epitopes within the pole, GAG, and NEF genomic regions. And this was shown by this uh, uh, heat map where the pre-therapy samples and the rebound samples where there is, and rebound one samples where there's no control, they did not contain these mutations that were found in pole, GAG, and NEF. However, the rebound two and rebound three uh, uh, samples did contain 25 to 75% of the epitopes within these rebound two and rebound three samples contained these mutations in pole, GAG, and NEF. And GAG was specifically, it was very interesting because 75% of the epitopes at rebound two and rebound three contained this mutation. When we looked closer at this GAG mutation, we found that it did result in predicted epitopes that bind strongly to one of the participants' specific HLA alleles. We also found that this mutation is predicted to destabilize the GAG monomer. We are currently generating the viral constructs containing these mutations to determine the effects of these mutations and viral fitness and CD8 T cell mediated clearance. And we're doing this in collaboration with Stuart Turville at the Kirby Institute in, in, at uh, University of New South Wales here in Australia. In addition, we will assess the immunogenicity of the peptides containing these mutations. So in conclusion, for the participants who exhibited rapid viral rebound during all phases of, eight, of the ATI, the plasma-derived RNA sequences from all time points generally intermingled, and there was low evidence for compartmentalization by time point. For the two participants who exhibited transient viral control following art interruption, we have identified an association between the emergence of a genetically distinct viral population during an ATI and a delayed time to viral rebound. 
this would, would, was not attributed to development of drug-resistant mutations or to the emergence of experimentally verified CTL escape mutations, which might impact the replication competency of the virus. However, for one participant who exhibited transient viral logical control, we did identify mutations in predicted T cell epitopes within Pol, GAG, and NEF, which may affect viral replication and hence CDL8 T cell response and, and contribute to the viral delay that we saw in these time points for this participant. Investigating, so we really strongly believe that in investigating the interplay between the virus and the host immune cell response, will provide insights as to how individuals living with HIV control a virus during an analytical treatment interruption. I have a huge group of people to thank, but I would very much like to thank Gabby, Yunok, Katie, and Amy in my group, who, conduct, who contributed a lot of work to these studies. Our collaborators at the Kirby, especially Tony Kelleher, who shared the pulse samples with us from the clinical trial. Our other collaborators overseas, our funders, but most importantly, I would like to acknowledge with gratitude the people living with HIV who participated in these studies. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker will be Shelby O'Connor. She's a professor at the University of Wisconsin and also a principal fellow at the University of Melbourne. And she will talk about post-treatment control in non-human primates. And thanks very much for that kind introduction and um, also for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about um, our work studying post-treatment control of SIV in non-human primates. So I'll give you just a brief outline of uh, the short talk today, I'll talk about how post-treatment control in SIV is incredibly rare, although we've heard some really great examples of post-treatment control today. Um, then how our lab uses Mauritians and homologous macaques. What did I do? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, then how we use uh, a different population of animals, the Mauritians and homologous macaques, to study SIV pathogenesis. Um, I'll describe briefly how we undertook a therapeutic vaccine study in an attempt to elicit post-treatment control in these animals, um, but then how we unexpectedly observed post-treatment control in, in most of the animals in this particular study, and then follow up with a summary and some future directions. So post-treatment control naturally in, in uh, of SIV and rhesus macaques is very rare. We've heard a lot of different um, uh, versions of, of the way we could define post-treatment control today. I'm just kind of referring to it as, as maintaining vir viremia at less than 10 to the fourth copies per mil for months after stopping ART. Um, one large seminal study um, several years ago uh, using rhesus macaques to determine if early ART could induce post-treatment control, initiating ART at uh, day 6 to 12 after SIV infection was insufficient to induce post-treatment control, and those, those dates become important in, in later in my talk. The mechanism of post-treatment control, as we know, is unknown, um, was discussed earlier today by, by Michaela, and in fact, she mentioned how it's not associated with particular MHC alleles, even though we know that spontaneous SIV or HIV control um, it is associated often with MHC alleles. So our lab was interested in trying to understand if there were other macaque populations besides rhesus macaques that would uh, have a greater likelihood for post-treatment control of SIV. So we turned to Mauritian and homologous macaques for our work. Um, these are animals who arrived in the Indian Ocean island of Mauritius about 500 years ago, and then monkeys do what monkeys do. And now um, nearly all of their MHC genetics can be explained by seven common haplotypes shown on the left here, um, termed M1 to M7. So the association of MHC genetics and um, SIV MAC239 control in these animals has been studied. On the right, what you can see are, is a longitudinal study of M1 and M3 MHC homozygous and heterozygous animals who were infected with SIV MAC239, and they were followed for a year after infection. You can see that um, M1 positive animals, homozygous and heterozygous, shown in black and, red, black and orange, um, had uh, spontaneous viral control about half of the time. However, animals who were homozygous for the M3 MHC haplotype uh, were unable to control virus replication. And so we originally set out to, to test a therapeutic vaccine approach to determine if we could convert M3 positive animals into post-treatment controllers. 
So I'm not going to go into the actual vaccine study in great detail today. That, that was already published. But we had eight animals in the study. They were M3 positive animals and M1 negative animals. So they did not have MHC alleles associated with viral control. All of these animals were infected intravenously with SIV MAC239M. And at two weeks after SIV infection, they all started receiving ART. They received ART for eight months uh, in the vaccine group. Um, the animals received three serial vaccines, and when they stopped ART, uh, they began receiving immunotherapy. We hypothesized that the animals who got the vaccine would become post-treatment controllers, and the animals who did not, and they were in the control group, would become rebounders. But shockingly, we were surprised to find that actually nearly all of our animals became post-treatment controllers for six months after stopping ART, whether they were in the control group or the vaccine group. So the Mauritian macaques seemed to be predisposed to becoming post-treatment controllers even without any other intervention. What you can see here is that um, after stopping ART, a few animals had trans... <coughs> Excuse me. Um, a couple animals had transient bremia. Um, that went up to just under 10 to the fourth copies per mil, but was rapidly recontrolled. Only one animal had persistent virus replication out to six months after, after stopping ART. So um, we were shocked by this finding, and so we wanted to ask some questions to try to understand the mechanism. And so I'm going to tell you about a couple of those experiments today. The first was we wanted to know the size of the intact proviral DNA reservoir. We also wanted to determine if CD8 positive cells were important for this um, post-treatment control of SIV replication. And then if Mauritian cinemologous macaques as a population were uh, capable of exhibiting viral rebound after stopping ART. So we partnered with Matt Reynolds at the University of Wisconsin, who had been performing IPDA assays with um, SIV-infected uh, PBMC. And what you can see on the left is that we had um, cinemologous macaque samples and rhesus macaque samples. Both cohorts had been infected with the same virus um, by the same route. And at two weeks after SIV infection, we collected PBMC and performed the IPDA assays. Rhesus macaques had approximately one log higher um, frequency of cells with intact proviral SIV DNA compared to the Mauritian cinemologous macaques, even though the viral DNA species distribution was very similar between the two. This data suggests to us that perhaps the Mauritian cinemologous macaques establish a smaller reservoir than the rhesus macaques. Second, approximately 32 weeks after stopping ART, we administered a CD8 alpha-depleting antibody, and all animals then developed um, viral uh, plasmavremia. So this um, strongly suggests to us that CD8-positive cells are required for post-treatment control. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Mm. But... Um, yeah, so the CD8 positive cells were required for post-treatment control. And finally, we wanted to know if Mersin cinemologous macaques as a population were capable of exhibiting SIV rebound at all. And so we had access to another cohort of Mersin cinemologous macaques who initiated antiretroviral therapy eight weeks after um, infection. They remained on antiretroviral therapy for 20 months. And within just a few weeks after stopping ART, virus replication was observed in five out of the six animals. While it was frequently less than 10 to the fourth copies per mil, you can see that virus replication was at least persistent and consistent in these animals. On the right, what I'm showing you is the data from the, the two-week uh, animals that I shared with you before, and you can just compare and contrast how much uh, better virus was suppressed after, after discontinuing ART in the, the, the cohort I described before. So just to summarize, um, what we found was that seven of eight animals who started um, ART at two weeks post-infection um, these were, again, Mauritian cinemologous macaques with MHC alleles that were not predisposed to spontaneous control. Seven of the, these eight animals became post-treatment controllers for at least six months after stopping ART. We, we think that a small viral reservoir and CD8-positive cells are required for post-treatment control. Um, Mauritian cinemologous macaques who started ART later were more likely to exhibit viral rebound after stopping ART. Unfortunately, we don't know the mechanism by which these CD8 positive cells are controlling virus replication and post-treatment control, but we're trying to, to work on this now. So that we can consider in the future, we'd like to know what is unique about these M3 positive Mauritian cinemologous macaques that leads to post-treatment control, especially when compared to the more commonly studied rhesus macaques. We don't know what's so unique about our Mauritian, our Mauritian cinos. 
Um, we'd like to determine if this phenotype is limited to the M3 MHC haplotype. Um, and if there's instead perhaps a genetic feature that's associated with the M3 haplotype that might be absent from a different MHC haplotype in this population. And if we could figure out how to break post-treatment control in these animals, perhaps that would help identify the immune mechanism needed to maintain uh, post-treatment control. And so with that, I'll thank my small lab and Olivia Harwood, who just graduated and did a lot of the work that I shared with you today, um, our funders and other partners we've had in this work. So thank you. Thank you, Shelby, for an excellent talk. I'd now like to introduce our uh, last speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Tongli Ma from the Gladstone Institute. She's currently a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Dr. Nadia Ronan, where she's studying the role of biomarkers in ATIs. And today she'll uh, talk to us about post-treatment uh, controllers exhibit uh, distinct CD8 T cell features before and after ATIs. Thanks for the introduction. Um, I also want to thank the organizers to give me this great opportunity to present my research here. Today I'm going to talk about our deep characterization of T cells in post-treatment controllers. As we all know, the majority of HIV infected persons will experience a rapid viral rebound after uh, antiretroviral therapy interruption. We call these individuals non-controllers or NCs. Rare individuals can control HIV for months or years uh, after antiretroviral therapy uh, cessation. We call these individuals post-treatment controllers, or PTCs. However, understanding the mechanisms um, behind the capacity of PTCs to control HIV is still incomplete. So our goal for this project is uh, to characterize immune um, determines of HIV control in PTCs as compared to NCs. To do this, uh, we used samples from CHIRP study uh, established by John Lee from Harvard University. CHIRP study uh, analyzed the PBMC samples uh, from PTCs and NCs. Um, here's our study design. We have longitudinal NC and PTC samples, uh, including pre-ATI point um, that were collected at around four weeks before ATI. We uh, also have early ATI point that, uh, that were collected at around four weeks after ATI. And we also have late ATI point um, that were collected at around 27 weeks after ATI. We then characterized the T cells using set -off. Um, Set-off is similar to flow cytometry, but allow us to detect up to 40 parameters simultaneously. Um, here's our set of panel. We have lineage markers, including T-cell markers and B-cell markers to exclude B-cells. We have phenotyping markers, including markers that indicate T-cell differentiation state, activation state, or homing. We also have checkpoint molecules and integrants. We then applied this set of panels on all the samples we collected and performed a clustering analysis. So using all the parameters in our panel, we identified nine clusters. You may understand each cluster as a T-cell subset. We found three clusters of interest, cluster two, three, and six. I'm going to talk each of them in turn, beginning cluster two here. Uh, in pre-ATI, I cir circled here, we found cluster two was more abundant in NCs compared with PTCs. To characterize the uh, features of cells in cluster two, we used the CD4 and the CD8 in our panel and identified the CD4 T cells and CD8 uh, T cells from the total T cells we analyzed. We found cells in cluster two are mainly CD8 T cells. We then use the memory T cell marker CD45RO and the naive T cell marker CD45RA um, and identified memory and naive uh, CD8 T cells. We found the cells in cluster two are mainly memory CD8 T cells. Interestingly, um, cells in cluster two express high levels of exhaustion markers PD1 and TJ. Uh, so for the histogram plot, I show the markers expression on the x-axis and the class numbers on the y-axis. 
because cluster two was more abundant in uh, NCs in pre-ATI, and this um, data suggested more exhausted memory CDA T cells prior to ATI in NCs. Uh, then let's talk about cluster six. Uh, in late ATI, I circled here, we found cluster six was more abundant in NCs compared with um, PTCs. So the cells in cluster six are actually um, mainly CD4, CD8 double negative T cells express high levels of CD45 RNA. On the left, I showed the subset identification from the total T cells we analyzed. Interestingly, cells in cluster six express high levels of follicular happy cell marker CXCR5 and activation marker CD30. Both of them has been reported to be increased in HIV infected cells. Because cluster six was um, more abundant in um, NCs in late ATI and CD4 can be downregulated by HIV infection. So we think cluster six uh, may include HIV infected cells. Uh, lastly, let's talk about uh, cluster three. Although we didn't find any significant difference between uh, PTCs and NCs at each time point, but we do see um, cluster three increased in abundance in PTCs over time, but decreased abundance in NCs. So cells in cluster three are mainly CD8 T cells uh, express high levels of CD45 RA, but low levels of CCR7. On the left, I show the um, subset identification from the total cells we analyzed. Uh, interestingly, cells in cluster three express high levels of surviving. Surviving expression on these cells may uh, help to uh, maintain the persistence and the survival of these effector cells. We also found the cluster three cells express uh, uh, multiple activation markers, uh, including HLA-DR, CD69, and CD38. Because cluster three expanded in only PTCs over time, we think these activated cells may actively surprise simmering varamia in PTCs. Um, here's our summary. Uh, we found exhausted CD80 cells uh, was more abundant in NCs in pre-ATI, and these cells may contribute to incapable of controlling varamia in NCs following ATI. We found uh, CD4, CD8 T cells, uh, double negative T cells, uh, express antigens associated with HIV infection uh, are actually more abundant in uh, NCs in late ATI. We think these cells may include HIV infected cells. Um, activity the CD8 tumor cells are uh, expanded in only PTCs. We think these cells may contribute to controlling uh, simmering varamia in PTCs. Uh, finally, I want to thank our team at the Glassstone Institute, uh, Harvard University, and UCSF. Special thanks to the participants and the CHAMP study. Thank you all for your attention. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. Would uh, any of the folks come to the microphone? I, it's hard to see. I, is, do we have a question? Hi, I have a question for Sarah Palmer. Um, great talk, really interesting data. Um, so you showed in participant four, the controller, that there were certain mutations, particularly in GAG, at the rebound two and three time points, which is really interesting. I'm wondering whether you've done a similar analysis for participant five, which is also a controller that had even um, more kind of control at the, I think it was the third rebound time point. And if you did and you didn't see it, do you think it's other mechanisms happening? Thanks, Nadia. Thank you. Um, we have not done this analysis for participant four. Uh, no, participant five, sorry. But we will be doing that. So yeah, it just takes it takes a long time to because this script analyzes every single sequence. So it does take some time, but we hope to apply it to other participants. Thank you. Next question. Mirko Perdini from Emory, a question for Shelby. A very interesting presentation. So you showed the level of IPDA between the two species. I believe that was on total CD4, so I was curious if you have a chance to look if the quality of the reservoir is different, is more on short-lived cells compared to long-lived cells. And the other question, if you have a chance to look in tissue, lymph node, or gut. 
Um, so those are, are really good questions. So the data I showed was actually from PBMC. So we need to do it where we isolate CD4s. That's sort of a future step. Um, we were just start, start getting our hands wet with this, uh, uh, our hands dirty, I guess, with this assay right now. Um, and trying to be able to phenotype them better is also a really great thing that we should do as well as looking more into tissues. We're currently doing a study looking at um, Richardson and homologous macaques just in rhesus macaques side by side and collecting a whole bunch more samples so that we can do a much more exhaustive analysis with IPDA of that study. Next. Hi, this is Kira Clayton from UMass Medical School. I have a question for Keith Reeves. Hi, Keith. Um, you know, I, I find the, the antigen-specific um, NKG2C positive cells really striking, and I think the peptide data presented in HLAE is really nice. Um, can you comment on the regulation of HLAE expression on the surface of infected cells? Because I know a lot of people use NF43, which upregulates it, but there was a recent paper from a few years ago suggesting that, you know, strains derived from patients actually downregulate HLAE, and so whether you think that that's um, going to have a different effect. No, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a fantastic question. Um, I, I cannot speak to it because it's something that, that we have not tested. Um, I, I think it would be a very interesting um, uh, thing to evaluate because then maybe you're thinking about, you know, is this um, a potential reason why HLAE gets downregulated because there is this pressure. And so, for example, I could envision an experiment where, you know, individuals that you have these robust responses, because they're not found in everyone. I mean, it's the vast majority of patients, but does that correlate you know, with sort of these changes in HLAE as some form of escape from this mechanism? But no, I think it's a fascinating and fantastic question. It's just not something we've done so far. Go ahead, next. My question's also for Keith. This is Julie Ake with MHRP. Um, humble clinician question. <laughs> you talked about the elicitation of vaccine-induced responses um, for these antigen-specific NK cells with a variety of different vaccine platforms. But the burning question is, mRNA vaccines. Are you looking at it in any of the mRNA vaccine platforms for any pathogens? The answer is yes, but I don't have any data for you. Okay. <laughs> Stay tuned, I guess. Stay tuned, yeah. Yes. Next question, please. Thanks. Uh, another question for Sarah. So that, that was really interesting, and the heat map. Uh, with CD8, potential CD8 epitopes was, was fascinating. So yes. I, I thought I understood what the story was, but then as you went on, I think maybe I, <laughs> I, I didn't. So I thought you were going to say that the first rebound had maybe boosted a CD8 response that was then selecting what could grow out in the second and third rebound. Yes, that, so, that's one of our hypotheses, okay, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell if you thought that the CD8, that the epitopes were converting from resistant to sensitive or sensitive to resistant. Or maybe so, you can't tell. Yeah, we don't know at this point whether they really are um, CTL escape mutations, but they are mutations within the epitopes. So, yeah, but our, one of our hypotheses is absolutely that we think it's the priming of the CD8s with the first rebound, which then control the virus at the second, that virus is the second and third rebound, or, or at the third rebound. Okay. So, yeah, thanks, Eli. Thanks, yeah. Okay, next question, please. Okay, my question is also for Sarah. Thanks for such an interesting and intriguing presentation. Um, I wondered if you could maybe speculate a little bit about the phenomenon that you've observed where transient control seemed to be associated with a slightly different virus and what that might mean for the heterogeneity we see in treatment interruption studies in all of the therapeutics that we heard about earlier. And do you think we need to be looking at the rebound virus in terms of fitness and replication and CTL escape to potentially explain some of those things that we observe and then attribute to our therapeutics. Absolutely. I think we should be looking at all of those things. <laughs> so I would totally agree with you. And I, for us, the, the genetic change was striking. And we didn't expect that, to be honest. We were doing this sequencing. And I know Katie was like, oh, OK. But then when we started looking at the rebound virus and seeing that it's very, very different, there's something else going on there. And whether it is that the CD8s are being primed by that first re, um, rebound, I don't know. So yes, I do think we should really further analyze all ATI samples. Um, absolutely, thank you. Maybe I'll ask one last question if there's no other audience questions to keep, oh, I'm sorry, just one over there, it's hard thank to you. see. Thanks, I'm um, sorry, another question for Sarah, very fascinating. I'm, I'm wondering how deep the sequencing uh, was um, and if you had some of those variant sequences pre-existing but maybe in low copy initially? That's an excellent question. 
We typically try to sequence up to 50 um, viral genomes, which is pretty deep for full-length sequencing. But there could be some very minor populations in the baseline and rebound one. Um, one suggestion I had was that what someone suggested was that we do a short region and just look for those changes. But the only problem I have with that is that maybe it's not a replication competent virus because we have seen up to 45% of viruses in the plasma are defective, believe it or not. So yeah, so we have to be really careful. And that's why we did apply the full length sequencing, but it's not as, it's not as efficient. I would totally agree with that. So it could be that we are missing some of those minor populations, both in the pre-therapy and in the rebound one. So thank you. Maybe I could ask one last question of Keith. Um, is there's a lot of interest in trained immunity in HIV and looking at some of the epigenetics, especially as it might relate to uh, vaccine responses. Have you done any work in that regard in looking at, at that aspect? So, so we have, and I mean, I mean, there's definitely, because I mean, I, I simplified it today, but I mean, there's five or six different types, I guess, of adaptive uh, in case of a response. And at least one of them, there's a clear epigenetic component. Um, and you know some of this your story has, has done this work and shown you know very beautiful um, you know virus uh, specific epigenetic induced changes that give you that same type of recall and I think those epigenetically modified in K cells are going to be somewhat analogous to sort of you know the myeloid derived um, uh, trained immunity but then you've got sort of these other forms which I think the antigen specific is actually quite distinct because it really mimics like a T cell and there's really no evidence for changes in, in epigenetics uh, in the cell population. So I think you've just got two distinct lineages uh, of the response and you know, how you could best harness one or both um, or in combination I, I think is, is, is an interesting next step. Great. Well, on behalf of my uh, co-chair, Michaela, I'd really like to thank all the speakers for an excellent session and give them a round of applause. I believe uh, Dr. Deeks is the chair of the next session.